how is the audio? Is it? Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, I've had to use this old junky headset and the pad, the foam pads flake off and stick to my ears when I take it off. Okay, as long as you can hear it, <laughs> that's okay. My built-in mic isn't working very well in the laptop. I do have a good external mic um, that I should be getting back sometime this week. My daughter has it at school. She's going back to school tomorrow in Waterloo. So um, I'll get it sent home. So I should have a better mic and not have to wear this crappy old headset moving forward. So what are we going to do today? Let's have a look. A couple different things in class. Um, whoops. Hang on. We're not going to talk about the midterm yet. We can remove that because we still have class next week. Um, probably help if I had the right learning objectives. Okay. Well, we'll ignore that because I forgot to update this file. <clears throat> so we're going to do a little activity, a review of Git and GitHub. We're going to do an in-class lab. It's not a coding lab. It's basically for reviewing Git and GitHub concepts. 2.5 easy percent for everybody that's here, and um, we'll get into the lab shortly. And then we're going to look at just doing a little more, a few more customizations in our PHP tunes. And then we'll probably wrap up early. We should be done by, um, we should be done by two o'clock. And then whatever time we have left, you're either free to go or I will stick around in the room and answer questions or give people help if you're working on assignment uh, one, which is due on Sunday night. Okay. So by way of introduction, I want you to use the chat and just tell me what's one thing that you learned or remember about Git and GitHub from our conversation in class last week? Anything at all? Okay, 20 says it's excellent for version control. Yep. Yeah, that's right, Alessia. We can use it as part of our portfolio for showing employers our work. Absolutely. Yeah, it's useful for literally everything. That's true, Mike. Yeah, it's great for collaboration. We can use it to revert or roll back. It saves our code in case our power dies. They have their own hosting service as well. So you can host static sites directly on, I think, github.io or GitHub pages. Yep. OK, these are all, yeah, it's got great tools. It's got things like Kanban boards. It's got issue tracking baked right into GitHub. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pause the recording in a minute. Um, and I want you to open up. There's a link here, this Lab 2 in class. You can find it under in the Lesson 5 folder. There's a link right in the middle here. It says Lab 2 in class. So click this link, and it's going to open up a PowerPoint slide in your brow PowerPoint slide deck. Please open it in your browser, OK? We're going to be working collaboratively in this file. So probably open it up in a new tab. I should have added that to the link. I apologize. Just open it in a new tab. So we're going to be editing this file together in the browser. So don't download it. It might seem a little slow, but that's only because there's lots of users in the one file. So in a minute, I'm going to pause the recording. I'm going to set up eight breakout rooms. So you're going to be automatically assigned to a breakout room in WebEx. to be four, four to five students per room. Okay. Each breakout group is going to be assigned one question about Git and GitHub. Okay. So if you're in group one, there's a title slide here, but group one, your question is going to be here. So what's Git and why is it so widely used? As a group, there are four things you need to put into your slide. Okay. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to answer the question that's being asked to your group. So group one is going to type a useful description. I want it to be in your own words. This is not a copy and paste from Wikipedia. Okay. So you're going to put your best answer here. You're going to add all of your names to the slide so I can be sure to give you your marks. You're going to find an image that helps describe or explain your answer and you'll you'll exchange this I am a placeholder image with an image of your own. 
And then the one other thing I want you to add to your slide is make sure you add the source of your image. So cite what URL did you find it on? Maybe you found it on a tutorial site. Maybe you found it directly on the GitHub docs. Maybe you found it in a, a just through your search engine. So cite the source of whatever image you find. Right? So there are nine slides. So you just ignore the title slide. So I will automatically assign everybody to a breakout room. You can use your mics or use the chat in the breakout room. Think about 15 to 20 minutes for this activity should be enough time. So, or maybe till 1230. Once your group is done, you can just give me a thumbs up. I will check in on each of the breakout rooms and you can also send me a message or ask for, use the ask for help feature. If you have a question and you need me to jump into your room. Okay, so easy couple two and a half percent work together with the other people in your breakout room and complete your slide and then this should give us a nice set of kind of notes that you can refer to about how git works and some of the commands okay are there any questions about the lab before i put you off into the breakout rooms Okay, I'm going to pause my recording, go out into the breakout rooms, we'll come back at 1230 and we can review the work that you've all done. So remember your answers, your names, an image, and a citation of where you found the image. So you don't need to submit anything on D2L. I will just go through the slides and give everybody who participated a grade, but let's look at what you found. And then I think we, we've got a pretty good set of notes here. I think you may be muted, sir. Oh, we can hear him. I could hear him. Uh, you, not, yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Mic on? Yeah. Okay. Good. So um, I will just reshare my screen and let's have a look, kind of go over what you guys found. Um, I won't read it, but yeah, it's obviously really widely used. It's about collaboration and it's for monitoring and tracking changes. And it also allows merging and branching, which we'll talk a little bit later on as we get into the slide. Um, okay, so you guys found this on C-Sharp Corner, which is a great site. And it's kind of got the full scale overview of the interaction between client machines and how Git works. Thanks. One. So yeah, we use in it to initialize a local repository. So it's going to tell Git to watch this folder and any files and folders inside. Okay, so nothing we do in Git is going to work unless we run Git in it first. Okay, and uh, yeah, you guys gave us even gave us the screenshot when we run that command Git in it, we'll get this message saying that it's initialized an empty Git repository. All right. So git add, this is what we do for tracking any changes. So that might mean files we've created, files we've deleted, or files that were already tracked by git, but we, where we've modified. So it's called staging when we are preparing them to be committed. Okay. Thanks, group three. So git commit takes those files that we added with our git add to our staging environment and it creates a snapshot. So basically a window of looking at our project at a specific place and a specific time. And yet we want to use it often. So the code is up to date and we're always going to provide a message that describes what changes were done. That's useful image. So we can see each commit, each version being saved to disk as a snapshot in time. Um, here's a question for Akeem, Chris, Hussein, Alessio. How often, wh what's a reasonable time? Like how often do you commit? If you're um, working on a project, how often would you do it? I commit after like every chunk basically. Like, so pretty often. Okay, so you do it after every chunk? Yeah, yeah. kind of like almost every time I save. Like after I run it and it looks good, it's like, okay. But I also run my code often. Okay. 
All right. Um, what about uh, Akeem, Chris, Hussein? What about you guys? You I agree with that. Change? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And as long as you have finished the change and you have commented everything you want to, then it's good to be yep. committed. Yep. So I would typically I will commit for sure when I'm done working for the day. But yeah, basically, if I finish a feature and it's working, I'm going to commit it. So if my machine blows up, I make sure that I've archived that change up to GitHub. So we'll see. So here, for example, in this project, um, if we go and look at the commit history, 703 commits have been made here. And this project goes, I mean, it's been running for several years now. It's probably two or three years old, this project, but, you know, multiple commits every day, typically. And um, in when we do our, our practical exams, I actually will have you commit every 30 minutes during the exam. So that way you're not going to lose your work and I can see the progress of your work through the exam. So adding our remote, yeah, it connects our local machine to the remote repository and it requires a branch. The default branch is called master and we'll talk more about branches in a bit. Yep. And then we can back up our code to a remote server. Okay, good, yep, and that's a useful diagram that you've posted as well, and you've also given us a screenshot of the command, which is great. All right, thank you, group five. So git push, yeah, it's all about uploading. So we're taking our local snapshot, our local commit, and we are syncing it to GitHub so that it lives, it's visible. Yeah, that's right, it's visible to anybody through the commit history. And that's a the the new commit is available as immediately once we push. And again, you've given us the sequence of commands and screenshot. That's great, useful to have. Now, git pull we haven't really used, so it does a fetch and merge. So if pushing is uploading, then pulling is downloading. So this will get all the file changes as well as the history, any additions or deletions. So when would we use git pull? We're probably not going to use it very much during this class, but it is very useful. So maybe I'll ask Twani, Tyler, uh, Fee, and Aiden. When would you use git pull? when you need to get the recent changes from the remote repository. Okay, yep. So why might I need to do that? Like what would be uh, a scenario where I wouldn't have it? That's right, Connor, exactly. So let's say, uh, Connor, you and I are working on a project together, okay? I, in my old age, I no longer sleep in. I wound up, wind up waking up early and I'm most productive in the morning. So I get up early. I'm up at like seven every day, even without an alarm. Um, I do my work in the morning. And then I'm done working, you know, I finish my stuff by noon. I push my changes up to GitHub. I'm done for the day. Now, Connor is a night owl. He likes working in the evening. So Connor sits down after dinner. Um, before he starts work, the very first thing he should do is run a Git pull. Because so that his version of the project, he needs to get my changes from GitHub. So he does a Git pull. It will download all the work I've put in the repository. So when Connor starts working, his version is now up to date and it includes my latest changes. Okay, so pulling is especially important when we're collaborating with others. So that's the first thing you do when you're collaborating. Sit down, you open your machine, you do a git pull. And as Akeem said, yeah, it fetches the updates from your, well, typically it's the master branch, but we will talk a bit more about branching. Yeah, so branches, there's a few different ways of using branches. Yes, it allows us to work on new features or fix bugs without affecting our current working version of the project. So that's really important. So it's not separate folders. So there's several different ways we can use branches. Yeah, the whole the main point is about keeping changes isolation in isolation so that they don't impact our main or our master branch. So master it's just the default. So if every time you make a repository, we automatically get a branch called master. And typically that is like used as our production branch. 
that that has kind of the live version of our code. So there's different ways of structuring branching. Just have a look. So for example, common way. So this light blue branch might represent our master branch. So this is like our production application. Maybe it's a website and it's been running on the server. So this is the current code. When we go to the website, we get this version of the code here. So this purple branch, this might be a debug branch. Maybe there are bugs that have been reported. So when we make a branch, let's say we make a debug branch, it copies the master branch, gives it a new name, which we can then check out so we can work and push changes to, let's say, this bug fit debugging branch. Or maybe we have new features that we have to add that we want to work on. It's going to take us a while. So we can check out the master branch. Sorry, we can we can make a new branch, you know, with new feature set. It copies all the existing code, and then we can work in isolation without affecting the master branch. And then when we're done working on our branch, we have the ability to merge our changes back into the master. So I'll show you some examples of what this might look like. So this was a student project. So they would create branches for different parts of the application. So they had all kinds of different branches. And so here they had a password reset branch. So they basically created a copy of the master branch. The student worked on implementing a password reset. And then when it was all done, eventually he merged his changes. So he did 43 commits in this branch, took him a while. And then eventually he was able to merge it into the development branch. And GitHub actually shows the files that were changed and merged. So we can see what things got changed. Here was the old code, here was the new code when he merged the branches. So this is a way, branching is a way that we can work in isolation. It also might work that we might give each developer their own branch, for example. So I can work on my branch, Connor could work on his branch, and we each have our own copy where we're not affecting each other. And then we can merge our changes later. So um, one of the other ways that we use branching often So here, this application, there's a staging and a master. So the master branch, that's the production code. This application is live on the internet. They also have a staging server. So anything they work on, they test in staging first. It's only after all the testing is done that they then will merge those changes into master and test it again. So there's lots of different structures we can use but for large applications, we typically have many branches, not just a master branch. So we can work in isolation and then compare and merge files once they're ready. We probably won't use branching in this class, but you will later on in some of your other classes, particularly if you're working in team projects. Okay, so those are, you guys did a really good job on this. Some really good explanation and useful images. So I'm going to leave this link up. You'll have this here as a reference the rest of the semester. Okay, anybody have any questions or anything else they want to add about working with Git and GitHub? How is your comfort level? On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being super comfortable, 1 being I have no idea what I'm doing, how would you say, where would you put your comfort level in working with Git and GitHub so far? 8, 8, 4, 6, 7, 8. Okay. So a lot of people feeling fairly confident, others maybe not quite so confident. Yeah, Alessio, that's common. It works, but if it breaks can be problematic. True. 
Yeah, Alex, you want to do practice with merge and branches? Um, okay, maybe sometime if we have a chance, maybe we'll be able to do that. Um, hadn't planned on it, but maybe we'll be able to build like a new feature branch and work on a new feature there and then merge it into the master branch. Okay, if we have time, remind me, Alex. We'll see, you. hopefully, maybe we'll have time to, to, to do that. But you're going to use it all through this class. I know Jarrett's going to have you use it in all his classes. We're going to use it again next semester in our ASP.NET class. So, you know, by the time you guys are done, by, you know, by the end of 2022, I think everybody's comfort level should be extremely high, like a seven and eight or higher. The more we use it, the better we're going to get. Right, Jared had you commit after each question. Yeah, that's another way of doing it. So the more you do it, the better you get at it. Okay, um, I do want to do a little bit of playing around, do make a few additions and changes to our PHP tunes application. So I'm going to get that fired up, start making a few changes. We'll take a break soon and we'll do a few more after the break. And then we'll wrap up kind of the instruction part a bit early. And as I said, uh, I will stick around in the room and happy to give help or answer questions about assignment one, which is due on Sunday. You have no quiz this week. Okay, so you, there was our lab, the lab is done. Um, I will en just enter your marks manually on DQL. And then the rest of the time this week is just available for assignment one. So first thing I will do, I'm already from this morning connected to our VPN. So we'll want to connect to the VPN so that, of course, we can connect to our database, run our site. I've also started my Apache server through XAMPP. Excuse me. So make sure you do these two things. Connect to the VPN, start XAMPP, and then we can open our code editor. I'll open up PHP Tunes. And I can browse to it locally. Right, here was our site. So we updated our homepage last week. We added Bootstrap. And we added a little bit of styling using a bootstrap table to our artist page as well as to our form and to make a few more changes use a few more classes and do a little more and then we also want to deal with this not very useful our genre values these are just foreign keys they don't mean anything to our end users so we're going to want to modify the query and some of the code here to fix this up. So maybe we'll start here on the artist details. So we're going to add a couple other components here. One thing is I want to add a little bit of margin to these field sets so that things aren't crammed together quite so much. We also want to use another bootstrap component called an alert. I'll go to the bootstrap site and go into the, the bootstrap docs so we can look at a few of these elements. So you're going to open up, we've got artist details. So here's our form. We use this container class to give a little bit of padding. But inside of my field sets, I'm also going to add the class of going to try M1, which will give a margin of one around all four sides of each field set. Because right now they're kind of crammed together. I want a little margin. So even though we had a form group class, I'm going to give it a little bit of margin. 
So now when I refresh, we just get this little bit of space. That's enough. I also want to put some, instru some instructions at the top of my form. So I'll put on a paragraph tag and I'm going to use an alert class. I'll use the alert and alert info, which will make my background of, of this little alert blue. And I'll say all fields are required. If your button disappeared, then there is probably an error in your drop-down code. So Dominic, you can see if your button is not showing up, the code is crashing before it gets here. So you'll want to fix that error. So if you view the source, you should, you, you'll probably have an error inside your select that you will want to correct. Okay, so I've added this paragraph tag on line 12. We can go see what it looks like. Alessio likes it. It's cool. So now I get this light blue. And Bootstrap, it has its own kind of color palette, which we can override. So it's got names for certain colors that we can apply to many different things like alerts or buttons or other things. So we can actually see the colors in the documentation. If I go use the sub nav under customize and color, so here are the main theme colors that come with Bootstrap. So primary is blue, danger is red. So we'll use this danger class later. If we want to show error messages, like when we try doing a login, if a login is not successful, we'll use a danger class. This light blue is called info. You could use gray. So we use this primary color for our button already. And now I've used the alert info here. If I don't want to use these two blues, I could, you know, I could always change this to like, instead of alert info, I could use, I think, alert light. And that'll change that alert from kind of a light blue to a gray, a pale gray. So you don't have to use the classes I'm using. Ah, that's too pale. <laughs> don't like that. See if I make it a darker gray. Sure. So I've got kind of a blue and gray palette going on. So you can experiment with the colors. We can also set up our own colors to override these if we want. And they even give you the palettes with the hex values. So if let's say I want to make primary you know, this color instead. I'll show you some other tools for this as well. So most of what you would want to do, you can find in the Bootstrap documentation. In terms of picking colors, We'll maybe use these later, but I'll show you these resources. I put a couple of resources up on D2L that I will show you that are really useful, especially when you are not really much of a designer like me. So in on D2L, in tools and resources, there's some free design resources here. So I've linked to Bootstrap. There's a few other ones I will show you. These are useful not only in this class, but might be useful in a lot of your other classes. We're actually going to use a Google font. So this one is the Adobe Color Wheel. Color Wheel is kind of neat because it helps you. It's one of the ways you can pick out a palette of colors. So if I want complementary colors, you know, let's say my customer has like a 
they give me this color, right? They say, we're using this color. I can use the color wheel and it'll show me complementary colors with my hex values that I could use in my style sheet. It also has the ability to let you upload a photo and it will grab the colors from your photo and give, again, give you the hex value. So if I wanted to include this photo and have a theme that matches it, then the Adobe color wheel is really kind of neat. And then there's all different versions of it too, right? I want a deeper, I want dark. So this is great. We often will get a photo from a client and we need to design something that will work with it. So the Adobe color wheel is a great free tool. So it's linked here. Thank you, Akeem. I haven't seen this one. I will add it to the list. Yeah, with this one, they actually like show you how to use the colors if you go down to the bottom. They can show you like how to how you, how you can apply the colors. And oh, something. that's fantastic! Thank you for sharing this. Let me let me update <laughs> this. That's great. And there are also sites where you can get free Bootstrap themes that override the default Bootstrap. Another one that I like is the material design palette. So material design, this is Google's design framework. So you can pick from the palette. So it includes not only the colors, it's got Google's icon library, which you can use, but it also has color palettes. So if we like something like, you know, let's say I want a, a blue gray, can pick two colors and a light blue. So I can click on these and then it will give me a palette. This is especially helpful for designing things like Android apps. So it gives me hex values of a color palette that works and it kind of previews this is what it would look like almost as a uh, as an Android app. But you can use the hex values and we can put these in our own style sheet. So we'll maybe use one of these tools to customize some of the colors later or you're free to play around and put these, put your own colors in your own style sheet, but we'll look at overriding. Um, actually, you know what? We got time. We can do it. Um, let's see, you know what? It's, it's 10 to one. I think here's what we'll do. Why don't we take a pause here? Take 10 minutes, we come back, we can actually create our own custom style using one of these colors. And then we'll also look at adding a Google font so that instead of using the default bootstrap font, we can pick one from the Google font library. So even though we're using bootstrap as kind of the, the main CSS framework, we can customize it to personalize and make the site our own. Won't take that long. Um, but we'll maybe need, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes when we come back. And then, you know, the world is your oyster. You don't have to follow me. I'll show you how to customize it. You can make whatever changes. You can make your site look um, however you want to. Okay, so we will take a 10-minute break. We'll come back at just after 1 o'clock. We'll play around with some of these layout and design customizations. <laughs> 